Okay. Okay, so let's start over. So um, it will be pretty quick because I originally planned for one hour talk because that was what was scheduled. And then I found yesterday is 30 minutes and I found today that is 20 minutes. So this will be pretty quick. Um, let's go. <laughs> okay. So quick introduction. So my name is James. Um, can really see my slides. So basically, I'm um, engineering manager at SUSE. So I guess a bunch of you will be wondering where I'm from. No, but there's a lot of familiar faces here, so you probably know. I'm actually from Singapore, um, but I'm living in Germany now, working at SUSE. So if you're wondering where Singapore is, um, it's over there in the red corner. And if you zoom in at that red box, you can see it, it's over there. Um, pretty small place. This is the whole country, right? So this is about 48 kilometers wide and 25 kilometers tall. This is the whole country. So it's a little bit bigger than Prague. I think it's about 700... 700 kilometers square. Prague is about, I think, 500 kilometers square. So we have 5.5 .5 million people on this small island. So it's a little bit crowded. And if you want to know where I live, or used to live, it's over there. If you ever go to Singapore, yeah, let me know. Okay, it's so more serious stuff. So what I work on, I work on Suzu Studio, this thing. Um, just to give you some context about why DevOps is interesting. So I'll talk a little bit about Studio quickly in five minutes. So we have a box version of the website. Um, basically what it is, it allows you to take an OS. So you have an operating system, you have your configuration, you have your application, and you can put it all in one bundle, right? So you have one appliance, one image. Um, what does that actually mean? So we have a bunch of different output formats. So you can create physical output formats like ISOs, you know, um, live, live disk images, stuff like that. We have a bunch of virtual images as well. So all your modern hypervisors, KVM, Hyper-V, Zen. Um, we have a bunch of cloud formats as well. So you can see Amazon EC2, and so the cloud, private clouds, um, and Windows Azure. So from one configuration, you can spit out all these kind of different target platforms, right? So, so we think that's pretty cool. Um, quick run through of the UI. It's pretty small, you can't see, so I'll just go quickly. You can choose a template. Once you choose a template, you can go to the software tab. You can choose the software you want. You can change the configuration. Oh, it's really small. So, but yeah, um, you can change more advanced stuff. You can add scripts. And once you're happy with the configuration, you can go to the build tab, choose the formats you want, and it will spit out the, the stuff. So usually, once you have it, um, what you can do is you can download it and you can run it in your VM, whatever. But we have this nice feature called test drive. So what you can do is you can click on it. It's going to boot up the image you just created on our server, so you don't have to download anything. And there's also this feature called modify files. So what you can do is you can actually diff the file system in its current state running on test drive with the original state of the thing. So you can see a bunch of files have been added, modified. You can click on diff and it will show you like this particular file was actually modified during boot up, right? So you can see exactly what changed. So this is pretty cool because you can, you can do stuff like you can install an Oracle database in this environment and the installer is going to change a bunch of stuff. You don't know what. So if you come here, you can see exactly what changed. You can cherry pick the changes, add it back to your appliance and build it again. So that's pretty nice. Um, and then you can also share it on the gallery. So once you create your appliance, you can publish it there and people can download it, upload it to EC2 directly. So, so that's that. That's my small sales pitch. Um, so let's talk about DevOps a bit. So you know we run a website like Studio Studio. So for us, getting features out to users, um, getting bug fixes out, getting new exciting stuff out is really important for us, right? So to make that happen, we have a pretty agile development process, right? So the development team can work on features very quickly in sprints. Um, but the problem we have was that we have development here and operations over there, right? So the dev guys, we're always like, you know, we want to do cool stuff. We are agile. We do rapid application development. And so we want change very frequently a lot. The operational guys, so we have like two sysadmins. You know, your job is to keep the servers up and running, right? You don't want the website to go down. So because of that, usually you don't want change so much. You want stability. You want to move slowly. So there's a bit of a disconnect between the two things. What makes things worse is that we have this barrier between them. We call this the wall of confusion, right? Because the, the, the development guys, they're going to talk about, you know, I want Ruby on Rails. I, I want to have MongoDB. I want to use Postgres, you know, all these kind of things. And the, the ops guys, they, you know, they think about network, they think about file systems. So the terminology there is a bit different, and there's this clash. So what happens in the end is that the development guys just throw the packages over the wall, right? 
They say, you know, I have all these commits. I'm pushing to, to, my, to my Git repository, and now it's your problem now, right? And these guys go to the beach on Friday, and they're done, right? And the ops guys now have to deploy on the weekend, and they're like, what's going on? You know, what's all this stuff? I have no idea what this is. It's a black box, you know? I just know how to operate this thing. So at some point, what happens is that the ops guys go like that, you know, like, stop, stop, guys. We have to sit down, we have to talk, and, and you sort of need to do this a bit to have more sanity in the system. Um, but it, it makes everything s slow, it makes everything uh, much more annoying to deal with. So really what we try to do is to try to bring the two sides together. And the way we found that this works the best is to really improve the collaboration, the communication, and to really integrate the two teams, right? So end of the day, you want both sides to, to feel that you are, we're on the same team. We have the same goals here. So for us, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about here, but there's not much time, so I'm just gonna touch on a few things. Um, so we're gonna focus on the automation part of this. So the idea is that you know once you get the two sides together, things can become much faster. And what does this actually mean for us in more concrete terms, right? So for us, really what we want is continuous deployments. So once the development guys have something they want to deploy. Uh, we are able to to do this, bring it up to production very quickly, to reduce the barrier, you know. Um, so once you have this, it makes everybody happy, like like this guy. So um, I'll show you some stats. So this is a graph uh, of the deployments we do to production for SuzuStudio.com for the last, I think, since 2009 in June, uh, and up to last month, right? So in the past, um, you can see we have a pretty regular deployment. So what we did was that. We had a weekly deployment process. So every week, every Thursday, we will take the code in the master branch, we will merge it into staging, deploy it to the staging servers, it will sit there for a week, our QA guys will hammer the thing, and if there are no bugs, we will deploy on the following Wednesday to production. So what you usually see is that usually there's at least four deployments per month, right? And in reality, we get a little bit more than that because we have hot fixes. So throughout the week, we find that something screws up, so we kind of fast track the process and deploy that hotfix to production. So this was kind of okay in the beginning, um, but still it was too slow for us. Because like, you know, if somebody files a bug, um, we know it, we fix it, we have to wait up to two weeks sometimes. Because if you have bad timing, it's gonna miss the, the merge to staging, and it's gonna sit there for a week in master, and then it's gonna sit in staging for a week. So to fix that, we, we move to the continuous deployment model, and you can see once we switch over, um, we can deploy much more. So the end result is that users are much more happy. Um, yeah, and it's really great. So I have 10 minutes left, I have to hurry up. So the end idea is that configuration management is not easy. So notebook. So one of my colleagues, Craig Gartner, he gave a talk at SuzuCon a few months ago. He was telling me this story. They are hit sysadmin, so this was um, what happened when he was working 20 years ago, when he first started. So whenever they want to change something to the servers, they have this notebook on top of the servers. So if you go there and you touch this config file, you added this parameters, increase memory by two gigabytes or something, you have to go there and write it down in this notebook. If you didn't, then it's not an official change. And so when the machine crash, what they do is that they flip through this book and they see, oh yeah, okay, I have to install this package, I have to do this and that. So it's a very manual and very tedious process. And this is very error prone, right? So today we're a bit more advanced, right? We use things like a Google spreadsheet to track all this stuff. But really, it's it's just a hack, right? So end of the day, what you really want to do, in, if you want to do all these things, you want to scale your, your services, if you want to deploy your services to the data center or to other places, to the cloud, um, you really should treat your infrastructure as code, right? So the advantage of that is that it's repeatable, it's scalable, and it's easy to maintain. So you don't treat your infrastructure your Apache config files, your database config files as just config files, but you treat them as really code that you can version control, you can do peer reviews on, and you can run tests on, right? So it, should, so it really shouldn't be that different from writing regular application code. So depending on your environment, this may or may not make sense for you, depending on how the, the teams are set up. But for us, development and operations is very close together, and so this works um, really well for us. So now I'm going to get to the main part, which is comparing Puppet and Chef. So can I have a show of hands how many people actually use Puppet? 
Okay, so about six. How many actually heard of Puppet? Okay, a bit more. And Chef, who's using Chef? And who's heard of Chef? Okay, so that's good. Um, so some general overviews. There are a few flavors of Puppet and Chef. So the ones in green are the, the paid versions. Um, the ones, you probably can't see so well. So Puppet Enterprise, Private Chef, and Hosted Chef, these are the paid offerings. And they have the open source versions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the serverless Puppet and Chef Solo, just to give a quick overview. So to install it, just you know, add the repositories with Zipper and zip it into package. Um, so I was looking at a way to introduce this, assuming that you're new to Puppet. So this is the, the one of the easiest examples I found. So once you install Puppet, you just need to you know create a test.pp, add something like that, and run Puppet apply test, right? So one nice thing about Puppet is that what you're doing is you're, you're describing what the system should look like and not how to get there, right? So usually when you do this kind of stuff, you write a bash script. You say, I want to you know, copy this file from A to B, and I want to you know, create this directory and so on. Uh, but here we, we're kind of, kind of describing a policy, the end state. So you describe what the system should look like, and then the framework Puppet or Chef will, will figure out how to get there. So it doesn't matter what state you are in, um, the system will just figure out. So this is um, pretty nice. And Chef, it's pretty much similar. You just need to create a cookbook. And if you look at the, the syntax, um, it's pretty much the same thing. So a more complicated example would be like that. So usually you have um, the three main things you want to configure. You have the package, you have the file, and you have the service. Right. So there are a couple of things you can see here. Um, there's some dependency. So for the service, you can see at the end there's a subscribe file. So what that is saying is that every time the file changes, I want to reload the service. Right, so you can declare this kind of stuff. And the whole idea is to really model your infrastructure differently. So instead of treating files individually, you kind of describe them as each file um, is owned by a service, and each service can be running on multiple hosts. So this really makes it much easier to maintain your, your data center and your, your clusters. So Chef is pretty similar. Um, so I, I put them side by side. You probably can't see it from there, but if you download the slides, they're all online. You can see that you know Puppet and Chef, if you look at the syntax in the basic case, it's really very similar. So not that different. Um, there's a concept of resources in Puppet and Chef. So if you look at the history of Puppet and Chef, they're actually pretty similar. So Puppet started, um, so the, the main creator of, or the author of Puppet, he was sort of the main contributor for CF Engine. And what he did there was that, you know, he, he used CF Engine a lot, and he found that it was lacking a lot of stuff. So he created this framework called Puppet. Um, and then there were a few consultants working with Puppet. At some point they realized that Puppet was nice, but it didn't really address their needs. So they added more stuff on it, and then it became Chef. Right, so because of that history, you can see that there's a lot of similarities there. They share a lot of same concept concepts, uh, but there are some slight differences here and there. So another nice concept that they have is called templates. Right, so the idea is that you have a lot of config files, and a lot of times there's a lot of similarities there. And if you can generate these config files, this um, often makes life much easier. So here we have Puppet at the top, Chef below. So you can see the syntax to create um, a template. It's pretty similar. So in this case, we have, let's see, we have three nodes, right? And we want to create a Apache balancer configuration. So essentially what I'm saying is that, you know, I have three nodes and that's what they are, nodes 100, 101, and 102. And I'll pass it to a template file. And here, this is the actual template file. So this is written in ERB. So it's like a Ruby templating language. You can see the syntax is pretty straightforward. You have you know, the nodes array. You just look through it. So for every node, I basically print out this line. right? And then you get the output below, the actual um, Apache configuration file. And this, you can see, is exactly the same for Puppet and Chef. It's the, the same ERB language, so pretty similar. Um, to support code reuse, right? so if you write all these 
what they call Puppet Manifests and Chef Recipes. You don't have to start from scratch all the time. So there are a bunch of modules and cookbooks out there. So you can go to the internet if you want to configure LDAP, you know, you can find some cookbooks. You can just download it and just add some variables to it and you can start using it. There's a lot of um, details here, which I don't have time to go into. So I'll just skip there. So that was kind of this, the simple singer machine setup, right? But usually what happens is that you have a more complicated setup. You know, you have um, a server running, a puppet master running up there, and you have all your, your nodes in your cluster. So what you can see is that running on the nodes, you have the puppet agent. So this is the guys that will talk to the puppet master, and you have factor running on the nodes. So factor is basically a simple program that would extract some facts about the the system. So it'll tell you, you know, stuff like what the hardware is running on, what kind of CPU, how much RAM, um, all that kind of stuff. So usually how it works is that you have some kind of revision control. So in our case, it's Git running on both sides. So you, on the workstation, you commit the, the recipes into your Git repository, and then you, you trigger the deployment on the Puppet Master. Um, there are a couple of other components. There's Puppet Dashboard. So this is a web interface to configure all your, your Puppet stuff. Um, there's a screenshot that I'll show later. Um, there's Puppet DB, which is some kind of caching agent that you can run to make things much faster. And you can store some additional data that you can query of your, in your system. Um, if you want to do orchestration, right, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do. There's this framework called M Collective. So this is actually pretty cool. So what you can do is that from your workstation, you can trigger this M Collective call. And it's basically going to broadcast. It uses a, a pub sub model. So you have a AM, uh, AMQP protocol that will broadcast to the network. You know, you can, so you can say things like, all machines on the network that are tagged with a web server, please do something. So this is pretty cool if you have a huge system, um, because this is much faster than SSH in a loop to every box. It's much more scalable. Um, this is the, the screenshot of the Puppet dashboard. So it's a web interface. You can see the Puppet runs um, on each machine, the number of failures, the number of successes. So pretty nice. Um, sadly, I just found out that they are going to deprecate the Puppet dashboard. So they will replace it eventually with something else. Um, this is how Chef looks like. So architecturally, it's quite similar, but at least over here. But there are some differences. So you have Git here, but you actually don't need Git on the server, right? So what happens is that there's a tool called Knife. So it's a command line tool, and what you can do is that from here, you run Knife create cookbook, and it's gonna push all the the recipes from your workstation to the servers. So this makes the the deployment a bit easier in that case. You don't have to worry about it like for Puppet on your own. You also have a, a web UI there. And there's a, there's a whole stack of stuff running in the background. So you don't usually have to care about this, but it, it's there. You have to set it up, but it's all working in the background. Um, so for us, the main difference between Puppet and Chef that we see is that Puppet is much easier to set up to get it going, but it's missing quite some features compared to Chef out of the box. So Chef is much more complicated to set up, but once you do get it running, you get a lot of features that you don't have to worry that much about. Right? Um, so the stack is a bit complicated to, to install. Right? If you look at RabbitMQ, that's a messaging queue system that's written in Java. CouchDB is written in Erlang, and Chef is written in, in Ruby, and uses Merp as a web framework. So you have a lot of different stuff in the stack you have to support. So if you want to communicate to to your servers in a cluster, um, Chef has a nice kind of a database. So what you can do is you can use the knife tool, um, and you can say, I want to run this command on all the machines that match this tag as well. So what's going to happen is that from your workstation, the knife tool will ask the Chef server, like, give me a list of all the machines that match my criteria, right? And then it returns the information to your workstation, and your workstation would, using the knife tool, you would just basically make multiple SSH connections to each node. So this sort of works pretty nicely if you don't have too many nodes, but if you have thousands of nodes, this doesn't scale so well. So that's sort of the, the trade-off there. Um, this is what actually happens. Um, I'll just skip that. And this is the Chef web UI. So 
not that nice, but pretty okay. So there are a bunch of other concepts um, in Puppet and Chef. So usually what you want to do is you want to model the roles um, in your in your system, right? So you have a, a, a app server. So in our case, we call it the UI server. And then we have some backend servers we call the runner. And then we have the database server. So usually what you want to do is you want to create roles for each of these. And then you can assign some DNS host names. So you can say node 001 is a database server. You can say node 002 is a web server. And this makes it much easier for you to, to manage all these things. So in Puppet, there's this terminology called the ENC, the external node classifier. So what this is just a, a fancy name that maps the node name, the DNS name, or the IP, to the actual row of the, the system. Um, Chef has a similar concept with rows and run lists. So you can see that there's a lot of same concepts, but they give it different names. And the thing about Puppet is that you actually have to implement this ENC yourself. So it's more flexible in that sense, um, but it's a bit more work to, to get up and running. And so actually for us, we've been using Puppet for a couple of years, um, something like three years already in our infrastructure but we're planning to move to Chef. So there's a couple of reasons why we're doing so. Um, it's not so much that you know Puppet is inferior to Chef, but it's really more of a matter that Chef fits our use case much better. <coughs> right. So for us, um, we have a team that's mostly doing Ruby on Rails, so we have a lot of Ruby expertise within the team. right? And Chef has a language that is basically written in Ruby, so for us this is a much more natural thing. For, for the sysadmins, for the developers to do that. If you're coming from <coughs> more of a traditional sysadmin background, this might be not what you want. It might be the opposite, right? Because Chef has, uh, Puppet has its own DSL, its own domain-specific language. So this is like, um, it's a bit easier if you come from a non-programming background. But for us, it's a bit limiting. Like there's some stuff we could do very easily in Ruby, but in Puppet, you have to do all kinds of weird things to, to get that happen. So Puppet knows this is a problem, and, and they have a Ruby DSL plugin as well. So you can write more or less Ruby-ish stuff in Puppet, but it's sort of unnatural from our point of view. Um, the other thing is that some of our other products, like SUSE Cloud, you know, they are shipping a product with Chef. So for us, it sort of makes sense to, to tie in all to that together. Uh, and also, Chef has a bunch of features, like I showed you before, out of the box, like the searching, um, so that's pretty cool for us. If we do Puppet, we can do all that, but we have to set up our own stuff. So this is one of the big reasons why. OK, so since I'm here, I figured I'll use the chance to, to ask for some help from the community. So you know we're actively trying to push Puppet and Chef in OpenSUSE. So um, is Boris here? Ah, so Boris over there. So he's one of the guys that's um, helping us package Puppet on on OpenSUSE uh, pretty well. So I have to thank him a lot because I tried to update some stuff yesterday, and of course I broke stuff, and then he fixed it. So so that's great. Um, we're also looking for people to to package Chef for us. So right now we have a you know one and a half, well like half a guy in SUSE that I sort of strongly encourage to Puppet uh, to package Chef itself. Um, but it's quite some work to, to keep all these packages updated. So if you like to do packaging, um, if you're interested, please look for me. Um, and we can figure out how to collaborate here to get the packages updated. Right. So any questions? So I think I left five minutes for questions. Any questions? No? Um, do you actually use CF Engine? Oh, sorry, let me repeat the question. So the, the question is, um, does it make sense to do this kind of work with CF Engine, right? So do you, you actually using CF Engine now? Okay. Okay. So I'm not an expert on CF Engine, but from what I've heard, um, CF Engine is a bit of a legacy thing right now. It's not as cool. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the way CF Engine approaches stuff, it's thinking more about the files the configuration files. The syntax is a bit more messy to handle. Um, you can't really 
abstract the concept so well. So from my point of view, I think Puppet and Chef is sort of the better way to do it right now. Uh, the ecosystem is much more lively than Safe Engine, so there's a lot of energy there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it depends. So, yeah, so so for me, the nice thing is that all these you know different frameworks. I mean, there are a bunch of others like BMC have some proprietary frameworks that, that do all this kind of configuration management. Computer Associates CA, they also have a product that does this. So you have quite some options out there. Um, regarding scalability, that really also depends because you know using Puppet um, and Chef, there are many people who who deploy large scale stuff. So I was at Puppet Camp um, in Nuremberg on Friday, and there are some guys from CERN. So CERN, C-E-R-N, they run the big, um, what do you call that, particle accelerator, um, the LHC. And they have like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of nodes, and they use Puppet to manage all this stuff. So, so you can also scale um, quite a bit. But of course, you have bottlenecks in your scaling. Um, so Puppet in version 2.7, the performance-wise was pretty bad, so you couldn't really scale um, to more than a thousand nodes easily, but you can change the architecture. Usually what you do is you put a load balancer in front and you have different Puppet um, instances running. The problem is that the compile time uh, is pretty slow for, for Puppet. So there's a bit of a bottleneck there. But that's why they added Puppet DB, which sort of acts as a cache. So this speeds up things quite a bit. So they just released Puppet 3.0, and now it's 3.0.1. And performance-wise, it's up to 50% faster than previous generations. So in terms of scaling, that should be pretty, yeah, pretty okay, depending on how many nodes you have, like a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. So yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks.